Yes, and this is Warren T. H. Creasy, Sr. Um, why are we here today? We're here today, hopefully, to get these awards for the men that really deserve them. This is not because I of my husband, and I knew of Turley, I had never known Rivers. I do know it totally. And uh, not only those three, but all of the men of the 751st who were really brave. They were not cowardly. They were not slothful. They were men who had courage, who had vision, and who had hopes that one day the country would be free not only for the whites, but for everyone. That they could walk as the men they were and those far by today to feel as good as anyone else. Uh, to pass on to their families the pride and courage that they had to grow with America. And hopefully we are making a start today in letting America know that we are not Africans, that we are not monsters, that we are not racketeers and killers, that we are like them who have pride in their country and who are willing to stand and defend that country, no matter what the outcome is. Um, when did you meet them, Major Creasy? We grew up together. And he proposed to me, I was nine years old. He was 12. Our families were friends. And uh, he came over one Sunday after Mass, and he was dressed in his dress clothes, and he had flowers and ice cream for my mother, and he, she says, oh, Harding, we never called him Warren, it was always Harding, and he says, I come today to ask you for your youngest daughter in marriage. He says, when, you're, when she's 18, I'm going to marry her. He was always a very positive person. Um, as a young boy, he took pride in everything he owned or in anything he did because he was always a man. He uh, served in World War II. Yes. Distinction so, and honor. And he came back and he went back to Korea. Yes. The Korean War. Yes. Tell us about that. How did he have oh. to call it? Because he knew his duty. He, in fact, let me give you an aside. At Fort Benning, the day the army was desegregated, my husband was part of a desegregated unit. He was the only black. He was the commanding officer of an entirely white unit, or company, rather. So um, he got his orders to go to Korea. In fact, the word at that time was, was that anyone going to Fort Benning at that particular time knew they were headed for Korea. 
Okay, when we came back from Germany in 1950, he was assigned to Fort Benning. Um, I was pregnant with our second child and went back home to Texas to have our baby. And we had, we had the baby, but unfortunately the baby was killed in a terrible accident that uh, was badly hurt. And then, so I asked him, please, you know, don't go. I need you, you know. <clears throat> and he told me that he was a soldier. That was his job. And oh, how I wish that I could have been successful in keeping him home because he left here from Fort Seattle, from Fort Lewis at Seattle on July the 12th and October the 13th. The end of our world as we knew it. I sent him away that morning and watched him at the front plane. Proud of his always uniform, immaculate, black straight. And I got that. Completely torn body. He had massive head wounds. His face was partially destroyed. His heart had been from the impact of the mortar shell. And I remember they telling me about mortar deaths with arms. Um, the mortar shell had hit his tank. He was going out of his tank to get to one of his disabled tanks. The mortar shell severed the lower part of his face. He lost 60% of the hearing, and his heart was practically shattered. Um, <clears throat> my first word of this was that he was dead. It was corrected, and uh, with the telegram telling me that he wasn't, they had they backed him to a hospital in Japan, and um, but. There was no hope, you know, because of the extent, the extent of his wounds. Um, I called the Red Cross and I wanted, the, I never failed to thank the Red Cross for this because I contacted them. Within four hours, I was in contact with the hospital. They told me, no, I couldn't talk to him because he couldn't talk. He had no speech at that time. <clears throat> Uh, but uh, he was awake, and I asked the doctor, I said, I need to talk to him. I need to let him know, <laughs> you know, this is okay. I said, put your phone near him and let him see if he can hear my voice. And they let me know if he moves his eyes or whatever he can move. They did that, and the doctor says he blinked. My like it, it looked like a glow of light came over to me because I knew he was strong and I knew he would fight. I began to feel better immediately. Um, they described his wounds and that they were transferring him to Letterman because there were two choices one to use a Letterman and because we lived in California, we would go to Letterman. Uh, although I was in San Diego at the time, so they w told me that they would alert me and they would be coming in. They started in, he had a relapse, they had to stop in Hawaii, and then they finally transferred him to Lebanese. Um, upon arriving at Lebanese, again, his physical condition was so bad that they really couldn't do nothing but to try to stabilize him at the time. So uh, to keep his face from collapsing, they had inserted a plastic block. He had a tracheotomy. A tracheotomy had been done on the battlefield in Quebec. And um, it was a matter of 
keeping him still so they would be able to wear injuries. They had it packed and blocked away. And um, he had no control yet. They had to put um, my, my mind does it kind of um, <coughs> gauze pads to keep the sun off of and, and they had to pump. Um, this was for years because the body was so bad and shattered and because of all condition. Finally, and they would begin building him up with uh, mm, high proteins and whatnot. And it was about really five years before they could actually begin constructive work on him because this was the intent that they had laid down his face. Um, he was on patient status for all of this, but within, I mean, I can't remember really correctly, but within, <coughs> within a few years of them beginning the reconstructive work, we put him on temporary active duty. And in fact, in 1962, he worked actively as one of the commanding officers at the Presidio because of the, the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban thing, you know. I nearly died. I said, they're taking me out of the hospital, putting me up. He had to buy um, clothing because he had nothing. When he was hit in Korea, I got nothing back because everyone thought he was dead, I guess, you know, and the army is not. Same thing after the war, you know. Uh, but anyways, he continued on a patient active status, um, working um, to whatever physical strength he could because he wanted to do it too. He says, I'm a soldier, I can't lay down. In between surgeries, he fought uh, for other military men who had problems at the hospital. He, at one point, um, this was when he was with the, I, I can't remember all the mm -hmm. military names, but he had this section that he worked in, and it had uh, a supply section or something. And it was close by the hospital, so in case he needed to, <laughs> which happened. Um, and he would employ as a work therapy, oh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes at a time from the psychiatric ward. Uh, and my husband looked at the situation, and one day he came home and he says, this is a waste. He says, these men are not profiting by this. And it's Scott work, you know, and whatnot. And he says, no, no, no. He says, he went, he met with several of the doctors and some of the army officers in Utah. And uh, he says, these men need a purpose. He says, I will give them real work to do. And he talked to them. And, and because they knew he, everyone knew my husband. They knew when he went into the hospital, and you wouldn't believe when the men, the officers, the nurses, the doctors, all would come and surround me, and they would say, uh, at that time, he was captain. He they says, don't worry, the captain's going to make it. Don't worry. And they would give me so much support. And when the critical times come, you know, they would uh, be, be strong, he's going to make it. And when, when the word would go by, Captain Greasy sat up the bay, wow, it was like excitement you wouldn't believe, you know. My last three children were born after the Presidio, and my last, all of them were reared out at the, at uh, ward A1, that was the officer's ward out there, from babyhood until he which was finally medically retired in 65. But um, 
any ways with those men. Who, he formed such a good program that men were going through there and some were released back into an active life, you know. And he received, my husband received commendations and awards for that. So even though he was hurt, he still maintained the same degree of concern for his men that he showed in the World War II. Because if you've read the book, you'll notice that one of one comment that said that these uh, people would some of the men would give up their position in order to ride their fiction. Um, at subsequent uh, reunions I've, that I've gone to, these men now are old, and they would say to me, "Creasy was the youngest one, but we respected him as our leader." He was a man. This was a theme that has always come through his life. He's a man. He's a leader. He's strong. These are the key words that would describe me. Your son is here. And yes. He's wearing that uniform of the United yes. States Army. My son is a graduate of West Point. And, and then aside to that, uh, when when you as a cadet, you know, young, but the incoming police, as they're called, are taught all kinds of things, not only the uh, wars and whatnot that they need for the military eyes, but they are taught to be gentlemen. One fellow who knew us, he says, well, there's one young man you will not have to teach anything because his father has been teaching him all of his life how to be an officer and a gentleman. And it's true. Um, this, uh, uh, the fact that your husband's uh, the nomination for the medal of honor uh, was not approved and it's being resubmitted and so forth. And uh, one of the reasons that it was disapproved, uh, what is the lesson in that for America? The reasons that he was, it was disapproved is simply because they were black. There is no other reason because if you read uh, the accounts of what the 761st accomplished, and listen, nobody is clever. You know, supposing you were to go out by yourself into a jungle, a vast jungle, you know that everything in that jungle is against you. This is what the 761st faced. Patton didn't want them, and he said, I don't give a damn who you are. All he wanted was somebody to fight me. But nobody was coming up with the kudos afterwards. See, Bates was the commanding officer. He didn't care for them. And I don't know how true it is, but I've heard this from several different places and ways and different, so many different places. I, I really believe that Bates says that no man at 76 place would ever get the medal of honor as far as he was concerned. Right then and there, that tells you that you don't have to be right. You don't have to be great. All you have to be is black to get kicked in the behind by everybody. You know, it doesn't matter what you do. When we use you, we throw you away like a piece of Kleenex. You know, to me, um, it would really make me proud, and our family would be proud too. Harding would say, why me? Give it to everyone, because we fought collectively as men. It wasn't me or you or him over there. We fought as a unit. And <clears throat> for the honor of having black men receive this so many years late, we can still approach our young people and say to them, you do have strong role models. You don't have to look at Michael Jackson. You don't have to look at Joe Lewis. 
You don't have to look at any other black entertainer or uh, sports talk. You have real men who, ordinary men, worked like your fathers and mothers worked hard for their families, who were strong enough and concerned enough about their country, despite all of the hate and the indignities that they received, they still went on and did their job. This is what the young black people today need to know. No matter who damns you, you go on and do the right thing, do your job. And hopefully, this will be the beginning. I'm not asking for Congress for medals of honors for everyone. But I am asking that the other people in the world, especially America, stop looking at us as ignorant, cowardly savages, that we are indeed human beings. Some of us are intelligent, some of us are more intelligent. We love, we marry, we create families, and we hope for the best. I was, I was the honorary founder of the 76th 